topic is the reality and the rhetoric of unemployment. Who benefits and who loses? So what is really happening with unemployment in Australia today? And does government policy and does our public discussion on the issue deal with the problem adequately? Or indeed with any honesty or truthfulness? To give us some insights into this question, we are very privileged to have Professor John Buchanan, Dr. Sean Wilson, and Dr. Alan Morrison to speak with us tonight. Professor John Buchanan is Principal Advisor on Research Impact at the University of Sydney Business School. Up to 2014, he was Director of the Workplace Research Centre. His prime areas of expertise concern wage determination, workforce development, and health and workforce issues. He is currently facilitating high impact research concerning corporate social responsibility and analysis of big data. He is also facilitating links between business school research and education activity with the transformation of health and well-being in Western Sydney. I'd just like to start off with some disclaimers before uh, we get into uh, my presentation at large. First of all, I want this to be known as I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I'm not holding out my ideas to be those of the University of Sydney. <coughs> Can I also say I'm speaking as a lapsed Marxist, not as a practising Marxist? and that I'm driven by a concern with the ideals of the great French Revolution, liberty, equality and fraternity. For those who are keen to try and portray me as some rabid left-wing extremist, I see myself today as a child of the Scottish Enlightenment. And the defining principle of the Scottish Enlightenment was to use the principles of human reason to improve the human condition. We were asked today to talk on the rhetoric and reality of unemployment, who benefits and who loses. And I want to say, I'm not actually going to address that topic. I'm going to talk on the topic of what can be done about it. Maybe my other speakers will talk on the empirical side of it. But from where I sit, the challenge is not to understand the problem better. The, ch the, the challenge within groups such as this is to figure out what we can do about it. What I want to do is have a fairly tight presentation, which goes through an analysis of what's behind the problem of not having enough jobs, and in particular, what's behind not having enough enough good quality jobs. I then want to outline some ideas for policy and what we could do about it. And then I want to finish up by just answering the kind of questions that are commonly raised in policy forums so that people can see these ideas are eminently practical and not simply academic. So what's the analysis of the situation? What are we what have we got to do about solving unemployment and particular problem of insufficient quality jobs? I suppose as a friendly criticism of um, my hosts today, posing the question, um, the reality and rhetoric of unemployment, who benefits and who loses, this is actually a very old way of framing the problem. William Beveridge's masterful insight at the end of the 19th century, and particularly in the early 20th century, was to say that a real problem with progressive analysis and progressive policy it focused on what was then called the social question. And the social question was, what do we do about the dispossessed? What do we do about the unemployed? And Beveridge said, wrong question. The problem isn't the unemployed, the problem isn't the marginalised, the problem is the dynamics of unemployment. Let's stop looking at the unemployed, let's look at what generates the problem in the first place. And it's by understanding those macro dynamics that we can get to the heart of the problem. The temptation is to look at people who lose, and I think it's quite legitimate as a concern of social policy. But if we want to get to solving the problem, we've got to get to the underlying causes. And so for me, uh, the beverages, key insight, and we're close to with Keynes on this point, it's insufficient demand. More recently, and I hope everyone in this room has read the number one world bestseller, Thomas Piketty's book, uh, capital in the 21st century. Because Piketty has shown there's not just a problem of insufficient demand, basically there's a problem of inequality. And Piketty's simple but most powerful insight is the problem of inequality isn't there that the poor are getting poorer. The fundamental problem is the rich are getting richer. And until we do something about rebalancing factor shares, we're not going to get anywhere. Now it's interesting, that, and I presume the politics and the public crowd knows this, but I'll just re-emphasise it, there has been a decisive shift 
within mainstream policy making that accepts the reality of the insights I've just given you. The IMF, the OECD and the World Bank and they are actually primarily concerned with what they call the problem of inclusive growth. They recognise that deepening inequality is in fact a fetter on growth and this retards the capacity of advanced economies to generate sufficient jobs to keep their populations fully employed. This is a fact that is yet to hit the Labor Party in Australia. And the fact that you've got institutions like the IMF and the World Bank to the Labor Party and the World Bank to the left of the Labor Party is a sign of just how impoverished public policy debate is in this country. If you don't believe me, look at the briefing the ILO, the OECD, the World Bank and the IMF prepared for the uh, G20 Labor's ministers last year. <clears throat> When you just read the executive summary of that document, you'd think you picked up something from Green Left Weekly. It basically talks about the problem of factor shares, it talks about problems of inequality, until something's done about those structural problems, basically you can give up on any effective solutions to the current situation. So that's the first thing. Insufficient demand and problems of deep inequality, particularly the rich get rich. The second thing we've got to grapple with is uh, the dynamics of competition. And here too often um, on the left there's a demonisation of evil and unethi unethical individuals. We've got to have a structural take on these issues. The problem is competition. I've got the quote up there from John Stuart Mill who couldn't have said it better. Under conditions of con competition, standards are set by the morally least reputable agent. And that's the fundamental problem. When you've got a society that elevates competition as the, the cardinal virtue, you basically got a whole lot of morally least reputable agents setting the standards for everyone else. So what's the challenge? We've got to make job quantity and quality central to the policy mix. And here, I think, you know, I am old fashioned, but I have thought about this for a long time now. The problem isn't to reduce unemployment. The problem is to have full employment. And that's hard, but it's not impossible to do. And we have witnessed in the past the ability of advanced capitalist economies to do it. It will require, however, a significant rebalancing of factor shares. Paul Keating used to talk about the rebalancing of factor shares when Labor was reputedly getting too much of national income. It would be nice if our Labor leaders these days talked about rebalancing it the other way, given that capital is now basically out of kilter with what the economy needs to maintain sufficient demand. The second thing is we need to have a different vision of microeconomic <coughs> policy. We don't need more competition. We need beverages key insight embraced. And that is competition, sorry, markets are great servants but poor masters. And when you put something that is a, what should be a servant in control, you get quite perverse outcomes. So what should we do about it? I think, uh, and once again this is a sign of why I'm obviously a lapsed Marxist and not a practising Marxist, I think the underlying narrative that we've really got to work with now is developing workers with deep adaptive capacity supported by model employers. Now that's not something you'll see in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, the, actually the Communist Manifesto's final list of demands is pretty modest. It calls for an advanced vocational education and training system, universal public education, and progressive taxes. So in a sense, this isn't too far away from what the manifesto is about. But I want to take you through these simple ideas because the, found, the analytical foundations for the ideas I'm putting forward to you have been developed by leading economists and philosophers, particularly Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, with their notion of capability. These people are giants in the academic world, and they have very simple but powerful ideas that the essence of public policy should be about giving people the ability to lead lives that they're happy choosing. That's a simple proposition, but it's a powerful proposition. And interestingly enough, Ken Henry wrote that in to the defining principles of Australian Treasury. So these are, once again, not um, marginal ideas. They are ideas that are on the cusp of potentially becoming mainstream. Like I say, perhaps Marxist, not practising Marxist, I think we've got to work with these other traditions to really push uh, the envelope on how we think about making the world a better place. So how would this manifest itself in specific policies? Well, I've basically said there are two areas. If you're interested in uh, the labour market, you've got to have a line on hours and a line on wages. And 
here the key issue has got to be decent earnings and decent hours. Basically, you've got to have a, a wage that allows people to be self-reliant. And one of the things that was uh, definitely learned through the Thatcher and uh, Reagan years is that the state was required to intervene to drive down wages so that people couldn't be self-reliant on wages. The state had to step in and produce things called earned income tax credits to stop babies starving. This is not a very desirable kind of policy. And I think Australia is very lucky to have a, an arbitration system which has delivered a strong and robust minimum wage and has shown that you can have decent wages and high employment growth. The second area where you do need policy is around a notion of um, skills and workforce development. Here, and I'll be blunt, the labour movement has been missing in action for the best part of 30 years. The labour movement in defining skill has basically embraced a thing called competency-based training, which has atomised skill and taken all coherence out of occupational labour markets. Uh, we've been doing large-scale research for the last seven years, which has basically talked about the need for revitalising the notion of occupation and vocation as defining features in the labour market. If you're interested in actually getting workers with the ability to rapidly adapt to changing circumstances, they've got to have an underlying capability that can be readily redeployed in other settings. So let me give you an example. Currently, uh, in the agricultural sector, there are 120 separate qualifications in Certificate 2 and 3 level. That's 120 separate qualifications for 2% of the workforce. This is an unhelpful way of developing a um, rural workforce. We instead have done a lot of work in looking at the notion of something called rural operations. And a rural operations worker is somebody who could move between horticulture, um, broad acre farming, would be able to do some basic um, mechanical maintenance, could do some um, fence mending and the like. And this where they where the work was down in one area, they could rapidly move from one to another. We've done the same in care work. Um, why do you need separate disability workers uh, from aged care workers? These again, why, why do they potentially need to be different again to um, childcare? There's an underlying issue of care. There can be an underlying vocation of care. And we've outlined what the um, capabilities in common would be for this and what are the social conditions for such occupational labour markets to flourish. So the priority concern should be getting strong and significant model employers who can practice collective self-reliance because employers have to be dealt into the equation. You cannot just assume that markets will spontaneously deliver employers capable of delivering the quality jobs you need without some structured support. You also need to have a focus on significant um, industries which will deliver employment growth. I'm a strong believer in nurturing industries with high productivity growth, but usually high productivity industries don't generate many jobs. Uh, I and colleagues at Manchester University and in um, UCLA have done work looking at where the jobs came from through the 80s, 90s and into the 2000s. And it doesn't matter whether you're in California, the UK or Australia, most jobs came out of education and health, agri-foods and the instrumentalities. It's interesting that this is where the private sector is now lining up for so-called corporatisation because these are the areas where there's steady demand for the essences of life. And I think we need to have a, co a coherent position on building up what we call the foundation of economy as a platform for strong employment growth. And I think finally you need to have that, those notions of vocational streams I mentioned earlier I gave the example of agricultural and rural work and care work, but I think there are also vocations in the domains of engineering, finance, customer service, business of services and logistics. So how do we answer the questions that are commonly posed in policy today? Where is government policy and investment best directed for more and better jobs? <clears throat> You've got to make a call here, and I'll be, I'll be blunt. We've actually got to go out of our way to help progressive employers. If you're a progressive employer today, it's a pretty lonely space to occupy. And public policy does very little to develop them, and I think that um, they are out there. And they are looking for um, lining up with broader social coalitions, but at the moment there isn't much for them to join up to. I think that um, government should also look at actually building up the foundational economy, 
we need coherent policies around education, around health, uh, in the instrumentalities and in the agri-food sector. What architecture is required to produce more and better jobs? Well, I've said there, labour standards and uh, quality around vocational streams. We need new instruments for managing risk because one of the things that employers face is intense competition, particularly from overseas. You cannot simply assume that every worker will be safe for life locked up with one company. But what you can do is spread the risks of continuity of employment through things like ethical labour hire. And you see this most effectively working in the apprenticeship system with better quality group training schemes. Not all group training companies are ethical, but the ones that do work very well operate on what is essentially called an employment guarantee, so that if you can't maintain your job with one employee, you can be rapidly redeployed to another employer in the network that's organised by the group training organisation. And finally, those policies around labour standards and pooling risk are simply supportive. If there is not enough demand in the economy, if there is a, a, an unbalanced allocation between capital and labour, the best labour standards in the world and the best risk management systems in the world will not deliver adequate jobs. There has to be an overall policy mix which prioritises for employment to make things better. Now, what specific policies will assist Australians prepare for, for the jobs of the future? Well, here we are pretty clear as a group of researchers, and we're about to release this work actually for the National Centre for Vocational Education Research. We've got to get beyond this mindless pursuit of competencies, and we've got to get beyond this kind of um, commitment to generalist uh, degrees. The idea of thinking about vocations and domains of vocations we think gives people the capacity to get um, something they can be proud of over time and a resource they can take from, them, from one employer to the next. And then finally, how can we avoid both structural unemployment and skill shortages? I think if you take that notion of vocation and you have the capacity that comes with it, we'll get a far better outcome. <coughs> I'd just like to finish off by giving you two examples of where I've found um, these ideas are being taken up. And, uh, and uh, you might find it surprising, I think anyone who knows my background knows that I've come from a left-wing background, but the people who have been most responsive to the ideas of outline and I have been rural community farmers. Uh, they really recognise that leaving it all to blind market forces is a recipe for disaster. So I've been working with the dairy sector for the last 15 years. They got us in because they, uh, with the dairy deregulation and the growth in um, export demand, they could not hold the labour they needed to grow. They got us in because they knew we wouldn't offer the solution of cutting wages. They knew cutting wages wasn't going to solve the problem. They have got so frustrated with the mainstream policy environment that the dairy farmers have taxed themselves to create collective institutions to build up adaptive capacity in their workforce. That is the kind of thing we should be looking for, and that's the kind of um, support the government should be nurturing. They get no government support for that. The second example I give is from the cotton farmers around Narrabri. They recognise it has been difficult for them to get the labour they need at critical moments in the production cycle. So they, with a local council and local construction employers, have created a labour demand calendar which allows the employers in the district to offer some continuity of employment across sectors. These are not radical ideas that will shape capitalism to its foundations, but these are ideas that will provide a tangible way of making a difference and give a progressive government the means to deliver quality jobs in a form that we can all be proud of. So, thank you. <coughs>